the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see. To him be honor and eternal dominion. Well, let's begin our service this morning by singing a hymn of praise about him, our Lord Jesus Christ. In number 291, Christ triumphant, ever reigning, Savior, Master, King. Well, as we sit, let's join our hearts together in prayer. Let's pray. We bow gladly before you, our Savior, our Master, our King, the Lord of heaven, triumphant, ever reigning, our Lord Jesus Christ. And as this season of Advent calls us to be mindful not only of the stable, of the secret birth of one who was despised and rejected of men, but of he also who is now Lord by right of all the lords of earth, his coming never again to wear that bitter crown of thorns, but the crown of glory, the crown of high renown. So as we are reminded of the one who now towers above time and eternity, we bow our hearts, Lord, in your presence, 
and we honor and we glorify the eternal name, the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. How we praise you, O God, our Father, for your great gift to this wayward earth, that we whose hearts are so tainted, whose tongues all too readily betray the depth of our own corruption, but that we should become yours, cleansed and acceptable in your sight forever because of the Lord Jesus who drank our cup of judgment to the bitter dregs that we might gain the prize for the road that he trod, the glory of heaven, the glory of our adoption to become sons and daughters of the living God. Lord, we pray, draw near to us this morning that you might touch our hearts afresh by the breath of your Holy Spirit, that you would ignite the flame of your purity, your beauty, your love within us again this day, that you would make us a people worthy of such a great salvation and a people who delight to share such a great salvation. And so, O Lord Jesus Christ, who at thy first coming did send thy messenger to prepare thy way before thee, grant that the ministers and stewards of thy mysteries may likewise so prepare and make ready thy way by turning the hearts of the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, that at thy second coming to judge the world we may be found an acceptable people in thy sight, who livest and reignest with the Father and the Holy Spirit, ever one God, world without end. Amen. Well, a very warm welcome indeed to all of you uh, this morning. If you're visiting with us for the first time, then you're particularly welcome, and I hope we'll have an opportunity to meet you and greet you after the service. We Warmly welcome you in the name of the Lord Jesus and uh, of the whole of his fellowship, our church family here. Talking of the church family, there are uh, notice sheets, I think, like these on your seats. I'd like to draw your attention to a couple of things on them. Uh, There are lots of things there, but one or two to particularly highlight. Uh, This evening we have our uh, first of our Christmas carol services, our carols by candlelight at 630 We'd love to invite you back to join us then for a service of traditional lessons and carols and uh, a focus on the message of Christmas. So uh, do come and join us here, 6.30. Uh, We'd love to see you. Then you'll see that there are details of some of our other Christmas services on the right-hand side down at the bottom. Our lunchtime carol service on Wednesday. Do pray for Rupert as he will be uh, leading and preaching at that. Then uh, Christmas Sunday next Sunday, Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. There are still lots of uh, the cards and the invitation cards to these services are available, so do take them and use them. There'll be no use after next week, and uh, we'd love you to use them to invite friends and neighbors and family to our Christmas services. You'll see next Sunday evening, uh, Sunday the 22nd, we will be uh, having a different kind of service. Instead of meeting here, uh, as usual, we're going to meet and go out carol singing around the city center. If you were here last year, you'll remember that I don't know, perhaps nearly 200 of us were out singing carols in three large groups and then uh, uniting together on the steps of the concert hall and then coming back and inviting people back here uh, for refreshments afterwards. So do come along and uh, be prepared for that next Sunday and uh, we'll try and make a joyful noise to the Lord in the city center and uh, we'll be handing out uh, cards inviting people to our Christmas services. If you look at the middle panel this week, uh, you'll see Wednesday is our congregational prayer meeting. Such a busy time of year, isn't it, for all of us in so many ways. But all the more important that uh, we take time to gather as a church family to pray, to ask God to be among us, and to be using very particularly our efforts for Him uh, at this Christmas season. It's right that we make every effort that we can, but all of our efforts come to nothing without the power of the Spirit of God at work. And so, It's right that we come together to pray. So do join us on Wednesday at uh, 7.30. One more thing on the middle panel there. You'll see Friday it uh, says mainly music is to be on, but uh, if you are a mainly music regular, you will know 
that uh, they had the Christmas party last week and that there'll be no main music this week. So just do take note of that and uh, don't come on Friday morning. And finally, a word of congratulations to Matt and Tam Yeaman on the birth of their firstborn son, Nathaniel, during this last week. So we're delighted to rejoice with them, and I'm sure you'll want to remember the whole family in your prayers at this time. Congratulations to Matt and Tam. Well, now, we are going to turn to our Bible reading for this morning, and uh, Andy Gemmell is going to be leading us again for the last time in a little while in the letter of James. If you have one of our church Bibles, it's page 1012. If not, you'll find it after the long letter to the Hebrews in the New Testament and just before uh, First Peter, which we've also been studying. And we're going to read this morning in James chapter 3 and this first section down to verse 12. So James chapter 3 then at verse 1. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. If we put bits in the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they're so large and driven by strong winds, they're guided by a very small rudder, wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, and yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brother, bear olives, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. Amen. And may God bless to us this his word. We're going to sing now a lovely Christmas hymn, number 351. I'm not sure that we've ever sung this hymn before, which, if that's true, is very remiss because it is a remarkable carol written by the contemporary author Timothy Dudley Smith, a wonderful juxtaposition of uh, great biblical truths here and the sonorous melody of a great poet at work. Child of the stable, secret birth, the Lord by right of the lords of earth. Bob, are you going to play the verse through for us so we can uh, get it clear in our heads? Thank you.
Well, now as our offerings are received, we're going to have a couple of songs from uh, the choir that was formed to sing on Monday evening at our senior uh, members' party. And uh, it was a great evening, and uh, those of us there enjoyed it so much, we felt that it was only fair that the rest of you should have a little bit of a snapshot. And uh, rather than uh, the pastors coming to sing to you, which certainly would have been <laughs> no snapshot of beauty, you're going to have two lovely carols from the choir. They're going to come and sing, Go Tell It on the Mountain, and then a lovely version of A Little Time in Bethlehem.
Thank you very much indeed to the choir, and I hope that everybody downstairs could hear that as we could up here. Well, let's join our hearts together in prayer. Let's pray. The hopes and fears of all the years are met in no other place but in the coming and in the marvelous ministry and the work of our Lord Jesus Christ. How desperately our world needs to hear the message of Christmas, O God our Father. And so our prayers at this time are that in this Christmas season throughout our nation and indeed throughout the world, there would be a clear and a loud and a penetrating proclamation of the message of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Our world is so obviously crying out for salvation, but in its blindness and in its foolishness knows not where to look. We long for saviors. We think of all that has been in the news just in these last few days of this week of the passing of that great national leader, Nelson Mandela. We cannot help but think, Lord, though, that in such eulogizing of one who was a great one, but only a man, our world shows its need for greatness, its longing for a true Savior. We know that that longing will only be met in the person of the true Savior, the Lord Jesus. We do pray for that land of South Africa at this time of national mourning, when the world's spotlight is upon it, and when, alas, it can be seen that great as that man was, that nation has not turned into the kingdom of heaven. That nation still suffers so greatly as does every other nation from sin deep in the human heart. We think, Lord, of the continent of Africa and pray for it this day, remembering the great heritage of Christian mission in so many parts of that land, which has led to many countries remaining there far more Christianized in their outlook than this country and other countries which brought the gospel to it in the beginning. And yet, Lord, we see the church throughout so many parts of Africa so greatly corrupted by the prosperity gospel, by that which is proclaimed in the name of Jesus Christ, but which is really a different Jesus, a false Jesus, who is no Jesus at all. We pray, Lord, for your church in these lands so affected by that prosperity nonsense. We pray for a true gospel to be heard and proclaimed. We ask for those whose vision it is to train and to equip pastors and preachers and those who will truly prepare the hearts of men and women for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ to judge the living and the dead. We pray that you would strengthen the church in the many countries of Africa where there will be today gatherings, so many gatherings of congregations of people who profess the name of Christ, but for whom the Bible is almost a closed book. There is a form of godliness, but denying its power. We pray, Lord, for the many parts of the north of the African continent where the dark power of Islamic religion is gaining strength and force and spreading and overtaking countries politically. We pray for these lands, Lord, where believers are greatly beleaguered and persecuted increasingly, where it is dangerous to name the name of Jesus. We marvel, Lord, that perhaps it's in these places where your church is growing strongest, and where the fires of affliction are stripping away the dross and the imperfections and the pollutions of the gospel. 
where those who truly love the Lord Jesus Christ and want to make him known are being purged and being purified. We pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ in lands like that. We think of Egypt and all the aftermath of the military coup there with the crackdowns upon Christian churches and colleges and believers. We think also, Lord, of the other lands in the Middle East, thinking especially of the land of Syria, dear to the hearts of some of our brothers here in this congregation. We think of the extraordinary snowstorms that have overtaken the Middle East for the first time in living memory and have made the plight of so many refugees from the Syrian civil war so much worse. We pray, Heavenly Father, for all such, but we pray especially for those who are brothers and sisters with us in Christ, who share the household of the living God. We ask comfort and succor and blessing and encouragement for all such as these, Pray that international aid efforts and relief agencies would be spurred on in their action to bring help and to bring shelter for those who are dispossessed. We think, Heavenly Father, at this time of year of our own nation, we know, Lord, that the greatest need in this land will never be a political solution, whether independence or remaining part of this United Kingdom. We know, Lord, that our needs go far deeper, that the only answer to the troubles of our communities and of our society, with all its fracture, with all its brokenness, with all its pain, is the newness of life that comes breathed by your Holy Spirit as he brings the life of the new heavens and the new earth into the hearts of men and women. We pray, Lord, for this time of Christmas when there are so many broadcasts on the television and on radio, so many articles in the newspapers about Christmas, where those in the Christian church who are public figures of recognition will have opportunity to speak and to be heard. Think of the Archbishop of Canterbury and other leaders on the national stage. And we ask, Heavenly Father, that opportunities given would be taken to proclaim the truth of the message of the Lord Jesus. Save our Christian leaders, we pray, Lord, from using these opportunities to become politicians. May they courageously and fearlessly proclaim the message of the kingdom of heaven. We pray likewise, Lord, for the churches of our land where at this time of year, so many people will come to congregations, to services, to carol services, who no other time of year would ever be through the doors of a church. We pray, Lord, that when people come, that they would hear not only the lovely words of the carols, not only the familiar readings of the Christmas story, but that they would hear the proclamation of the Christmas message, the preaching of the Savior, the babe of Bethlehem, who is now the triumphant Christ, the Lord of glory, ready to come again, to usher in his kingdom of glory, and to be the judge of the living and the dead. Lord, in the words of these carols, which so often capture not only the beauty, but the power and the wisdom of God, we pray that you would break forth into the hearts of men and women and boys and girls this Christmas. That even if it is but the words from a carol heard walking through a shopping center or by carol singers out in the street, that something of the wonder of your glorious gospel of truth would take root in their hearts and cause them to come seeking and knocking that you, the King of glory, might open to their hearts the wonders of your love. So, Lord, for ourselves, likewise, we ask that you would give us humble and open hearts. We would be people who receive faithfully your word and so proclaim it faithfully to others. 
Your Apostle James has been teaching us so searchingly the truth in the innermost parts that reveals what is true about us, that our words, our tongues, how we behave, how we act towards one another is such a powerful witness to the truth in our innermost hearts. Lord, will you speak to us again this morning? Open our hearts and humble us, we pray, that we might be people worthy of our Lord Jesus Christ, that our words may be heard because they are words of truth that chime with the truth about our lives, not empty and hollow words that come from hypocrites and those whose voices say one thing but whose lives say quite another. So, Lord, as we come before you, seeking your word, would you open your word to us and open our hearts to your word, we pray. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So before Andy comes to preach to us, then let's sing once again hymn number uh, 549. Number 549. The heavens declare your glory, Lord. Please sit and let's pray as we come to God's Word. (laughs) 
Heavenly Father, we re-echo those words we've just sung, that you would cleanse our sins and renew our souls and make your word our guide to heaven. Hear us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. James chapter 3, verse 1. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers. Well, we're going to be looking at the first half of James uh, chapter 3 this morning. And before we get to the detail, let me draw your attention straight away to two real surprises. Here's the first. What a strange command verse 1 is. Don't you think that's unusual? Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers. What a strange thing to find in the Bible. What a strange thing to find somebody who lectures at Cornhill speaking on this morning. Think for a moment who God is and what God has done. The true God is a God who speaks. He speaks powerfully. His words are very powerful indeed. They bring things into being. They're that powerful. And not only did God speak back at the beginning to start things off, he speaks still. And he has spoken a life-giving word into this spiritually dead world. A message about his son, about a great king and a great rule, a message of forgiveness for rebellious creatures. And far from keeping that message shut in behind locked doors so that none but a few eager spiritual pioneers can stumble upon it, God has sent that message out into the world. He has poured out his spirit into the lives of ordinary human beings and all the time is pushing them out into this world to pass that message on. And in plenty of places in the New Testament, the business of identifying and equipping and sending out teachers of God's Word is positively encouraged. And so 3.1 is hugely surprising that anybody has read any of the Bible before. Given what God is doing in the world, you would expect any statement touching on numbers to say, well, we want as many of those sorts of teachers as possible. But this appears to say quite the opposite. Not many teachers my brothers. That command needs some explaining, doesn't it? Well, here's surprise number two. Surprise number two is that verse one is the only command in our passage today. We don't meet another command until verse 13. Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. That one's for next time. Chapter, uh, verse 1 to 12 is a passage nearly everyone agrees about speech, about the use of the tongue. And there's no doubting how important speech is. Words have enormous power, power to build up and tear down, to help and encourage, to discourage and destroy. The whole morale of a political party, of a nation, can be changed by just a few words. With words, the weakest armies have been uh, roused to bravery in battle. With words, the bravest can be rendered powerless. Words are very powerful things. We used to rule uh, when the children were small that they use their words to do things, not just whine or scream. On those occasions when something desirable comes into view, and it seems much easier for a small person just to go, Ugh. The constant family command is use your words. And the truth is, of course, that nearly everything we do, especially in relation to other people, we do with our words. Of course, our hands are useful and our feet are useful for carrying us around and doing stuff. But most of what we do in the world, we do by speaking. Words are very important. And this passage certainly speaks all about the great influence that your tongue can have for good or ill. And at first sight, one might expect this passage to be saying, the tongue, it's a very important, powerful thing, so work jolly hard to control it, won't you? But that isn't what this passage says. Nowhere does this passage say, your tongue is very important, get a grip of it. 
in a book full of commands, in a passage all about speaking, at no point is there any command to control your speech. Now, isn't that a surprise? In fact, the only command in 1 1 to 12 is, let's not have many teachers from you lot then. Well, this is a strange command and a strange passage, isn't it? Why is this such a strange command? And why are there no other commands here about the use of the tongue? Answer, I think, this is not a passage about the tongue. It's a passage about the teacher. It starts with a command about not having many of them. And the whole thing flows on from that command. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For, you see how the logic moves on? Not many teachers, and then we get the reasons why not many. And the rest of the chapter fits very much with that subject matter too. After the negative of verse 1, not many teachers, verse 13, which we'll look at next time, is rather more inviting and positive. Well, who is wise and understanding among you? What sort of teachers do you need then? And verse 18, the last verse, talks about those who sow in peace and raise a harvest of righteousness. And you can't help think of the sort of language that the Lord Jesus Christ uses in the parable of a sower, of a sower who sows seed and a great harvest is produced at the end. We're in teaching territory here. This is a passage about the teacher, about not having many, verse 1, but, verse 13, having the right sort. Well, next time we're going to look at the right sort, and that may be a little while. But for this morning, we're looking at the not having many. And uh, we'll try and explore this passage for a moment. Why? Why, when there's such a need in the world for gospel teachers, why not many? Well, it must be because of the situation that James is speaking into. If you remember, uh, if you've been with us at all over this, this series, this letter is an antidote to Christians behaving badly with one another. It's a letter full of bad behavior. Evidently, James knows something about some Christians somewhere, we don't know anything much about who they are, who are behaving in ways towards one another they ought not to. And one of the big features of their behavior towards one another is their speech towards one another. Look, for example, at chapter 3, verse 9. Here's one of many examples in this letter. With our tongue we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. Strong language. It must be because he knows people are doing that kind of thing. And we find this is a situation where people are very eager to speak and slow to listen. Look back to chapter 1, verse 19. Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness that God requires. Why is he writing this? Well, because he knows that some of his hearers are not quick to hear and are very quick to speak and are very quick to anger. And that anger pops up all over this letter. And says James, in a situation where people are like that, maybe not many of you should become teachers. Chapter 3 has that quick-to-speak feel about it as well. Look at 3, 5. The tongue is a small member but boasts of great things. Or verse 14, he speaks of people who boast out of bitter jealousy and selfish ambition and so deny the truth. In a climate where words are being used in that kind of way, there are going to be people who just long to be teachers because they like to be in the public eye and they love the sound of their own voice and they don't want to listen to anyone else. In a world where everyone feels a need to be heard, The position of teacher is likely to be sought by all the wrong sorts of people 
and for all the wrong sorts of reasons. And that, I think, is what James is talking about here. And part of that remedy is to keep the wrong ones quiet before you encourage the right ones. The remedy, then, is not many teachers, guys. Not many. Now, next time, we'll look at the what sort. But James says here, don't rush into being a teacher. And his argument basically goes like this. If you have your head screwed on properly, you really don't want to rush into being a teacher because of what it's like. And the whole of the rest of verses 1 to 12 is an explanation of why you wouldn't want to rush into being a teacher, would you? Well, let's follow that argument through and see where it leads us. Why not many teachers? Verse 1, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. You're a teacher? Well, you'll have to give account for your teaching, says James. Of course, the judgment here, the giving account here, is God's judgment. So often, of course, the teacher only has eyes for what human beings think of his or her teaching. But James wants them to raise their eyes to the judgment of God. Stricter judgment goes with the territory of being a teacher. Of course, what you say doesn't matter much if nobody's listening. But if others are listening to you, then what you say matters enormously and will be judged more strictly. And James doesn't just leave it there. Not only is there a a stricter judgment issue, there's a stricter judgment and we all stumble, don't we, issue, verse 2, for we all stumble in many ways. And if anyone doesn't stumble in what he says, he's a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. It's not just stricter judgment that's the issue, it's stricter judgment and guys, we all stumble in many ways, don't we? Do we want that kind of judgment? If anyone's never at fault in what he says, he's a perfect man, able to control his whole body. Now, there's no doubt that James has controllable speech in view here, but the weight of this section is to make the point that we don't speak as we ought, do we? We all stumble in many ways, says James. How long do you need to listen to to my everyday speech, especially the way I speak about other people, to know that I'm a sinful person. How long do you think you need to listen to me before you know that I'm a sinful person? Well, not long. How long will I need to listen to you before I know the same? Not long. James says we all stumble in many ways, and if you want evidence of that, he says, look at your tongue. Now, uh, That, I think, is what he does in verses 3 following. Look at your tongue, says James. If you want to see that you all make many mistakes, take a look at the tongue. It's a bit like going to the doctor. When I was a small boy, every time you went to the doctor, you were asked to put your tongue out because there was a vogue at that time for looking at your tongue. The thought was that it told you lots about what was going on inside, and actually they don't do that anymore much because it doesn't tell you very much about what's going inside. It's rather changed, that habit. But what James is doing is he's doing the the old-fashioned doctor thing. You want to see what's wrong with you? Look at your tongue. That'll teach you what's wrong with you. And he goes to work on the tongue. Now, 3 to 12 is a little bit complicated, but it's all about how our tongues show us that we make many mistakes. Now, uh, the first, where he starts is he gives a couple of illustrations of things that are small that have big effects. Two things. First, bits and horses. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. A horse is a big thing. You can make it do what you want with a very small thing in its mouth. The small controls the big. Second, ships. Look at the ships also, verse 4. Though they are so large and driven by strong winds, They're guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. Small rudder, big effect. Now, uh, they knew that in the ancient world. We ought to know that even more in our world. Um, The biggest ship, I 
my, uh, my Googling came up with the biggest ship in our uh, modern age is a ship called the Seawise Giant. It weighs in at 657,019 tons. That's quite big, really, isn't it? And all you need to turn it is a little rudder. Well, actually, it's quite a big rudder, but for the size of the ship, it's a really small rudder. You can turn hundreds of thousands of tons of metal with just a little bit that waggles in the water. The little thing controls the big thing. That's the point. The little thing is very powerful. And, says James, in the same way, verse 5, the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. The tongue is very influential. It's a small part of the body, but it makes big boasts. And straight away, we're into its negative features. Verse 5, second half, how great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. The image here is of burning, destruction. Like a little spark which sets a forest off, so the tongue is with words. All you need to destroy thousands of acres of forest is one spark in the right place. Well, says James, the tongue has great power, not just for boasting, but for destruction. And of course, that's true. It takes such a small remark to cause a massively destructive burn in people's relationships. Don't you know that personally? Haven't you ever uttered the stupid or ill-considered remark? At the moment it left your lips, you know you oughtn't to have done it. Haven't you had weeks in life dominated by the fallout from words that took seconds to speak? Or well, that email that you dashed off in frustration, you typed it in a rage and you hit the send button because you were angry, and then it was done. We ought to have a license to be allowed to use words. James describes the tongue as a world of unrighteousness, verse 6, a fire, a world of unrighteousness set among our members, staining the whole body setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. Now, what does he mean by all this? Well, I think he means this, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is like the enemy within, like a little outpost of enemy activity within our bodies. Someone has described it as being like an embassy on foreign soil, the embassy of the world in the body of a believer. The anti-God world has set up an outpost in your mouth and my mouth and everybody's mouth. The tongue, says James, is kind of at the disposal of the anti-God world. And it has big effects, like a fire, like a rudder, like a bit. And often those effects are driven by the concerns of the anti-God world. It corrupts. He says, it stains the whole body, sets on fire the entire course of life. I don't think James means here that, that the body itself is made wicked by the tongue. That's not the way it works. You couldn't go home and chop your tongue off and be rid of your sin problem. No, it's more a matter of the style James uses to express himself. Often he looks at the outside for evidence of what's inside. And what I think he's saying here is that the attitudes and thoughts that are vocalized by the tongue are the things which corrupt the whole person. Now, the Lord Jesus says similar, similarly, but with more focus on the inward things. Mark chapter 7, out of the heart of man come evil thoughts and they corrupt a person. Well, I think in James' words, that would be more like out of the mouth of man come evil words and they corrupt a person. But it's the same idea. Everything about a person's self and life shares the corruption of the tongue. At one level, we are what we speak. What we speak tells us what we're like inside. The overflow of the heart comes out of the mouth. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and 
set on fire by hell. A striking image, that. I think it implies not only the satanic influence that often exists in the realm of human speech. The devil is, after all, a liar and the father of lies. He specializes in the manipulation of words. I think it also expresses the condemnation that belongs to us because of our speech. Hell is, after all, not the place so much that Satan lives as the place of his destruction. The end destiny of evil is hell. And again, here James is looking down the line, looking where things lead in the end. Not only do our tongues in the present express our corruption, the destructive influence of our words in the present age is a little foretaste of the destructiveness of hell in the end. And, says James, verse 7 to 8, we cannot control it. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature, can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. Verse 7. Beast and bird, reptile and sea creature. Uh, James is alluding back to Genesis chapter 1, when human beings created at the beginning have dominion over beasts and birds, reptiles and sea creatures. And says James, we're pretty good at conquering anything still, even with our sinfulness and fallenness. But there's one thing, one thing that we cannot control in the whole of the created order. Our speech, which means that the one thing we can't control in the created order is ourselves. I talked to a man a while ago now. We were talking about Christianity. He said, I'm a fairly decent person. I think what matters is that you don't do anyone any harm. Five minutes later, in the same conversation, he was lamenting the fact that he'd said something to his mother which had caused a massive breakup between them. And then she died suddenly, and it was all left unresolved. He deeply regretted those words. Five minutes before, he was saying, I've never hurt anyone. I'm a fairly decent person. If we take a look at our tongues, we'll know that we're really corrupt. Our tongues reveal our hearts, verse 9. With our tongue we bless our Lord and Father, with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so, but of course they are. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening, both fresh and salt? No. Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, or a grapevine produce figs? No. Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. Can it, he says, But our speech shows a division that you can't find anywhere else in nature. Apple trees don't produce pears, but real believers can produce ungodly speech. It shouldn't be, but it is. Here is another example of how James looks at our behavior and sees inside to a divided loyalty towards God. On the one hand, we bless our God and Father. On the other, we curse those made in his image. Just doesn't go together, says James, but that's the way it is. Now, before we draw some conclusions, let's say, let me just uh, point out two things that James is not saying here. He is not saying, your tongue is important, get a grip of it. That would be to repeat what he's already said back in chapter 1. No, here his point is rather different. He's saying your tongue is very important and you cannot get a grip of it, can you? No one can control it. A restless evil full of deadly poison. Second thing he's not saying, he's not saying if you want to be a teacher, 
Change your speech. Of course, there does need to be self-control in that area. But what he is saying, look, this is the way it is with the tongue. You don't really want to be a teacher, do you? Do you? If you really want to rush into being a teacher, you've got to ask yourself whether you've understood how things are in your speech and in your, and in your heart. Here's the big point then. Not many teachers because stricter judgment comes with the territory and we stumble in many ways. And if you want evidence of that, well, all you have to do is listen to your words. Well, now, let's draw some conclusions from this. It's a strong passage, isn't it? Let's draw some conclusions. There is something more positive to come. Verse, uh, verse, um, verse 13 is more positive. Don't lose heart. There are good things to be said about teachers here, but you'll have to wait till the next series for that one. In the meantime, three things. Three, uh, <coughs> three things to take note of. First, we need to be wise. This is a letter full of horrid behavior. And in chapter 3, having got under the skin of the horrid behavior in chapter 2, James focuses in on the teacher. And the reality is that so often when church life gets bad and behavior between Christians becomes disgraceful, somewhere in there will be a voice that has forgotten the words of James 3 verses 1 and 2 that words are going to be judged and that one ought not to rush in to being a teacher. If you want to see the root of the problem, says James, well, look at the teaching. And of course, that's the case. The teaching in a church drives the life of a church in all sorts of ways, positively and here negatively. You don't want to rush into being a teacher, says James, do you? You've already got plenty of that sort of teacher. Be wise. Second, be careful. Here's one for us. We're part of a culture that loves a snappy speaker. From Prime Minister's questions through uh, the spectrum to stand-up comedy, we love someone who's clever with words. We attach enormous value to the person who speaks impressively. We give enormous sums of money to the person who speaks impressively. We also belong to an insecure culture, desperate for approval and affirmation. And it's not a surprise to find then that in such circumstances, self-promotion by words is so much part of what we do culturally. We tweet, we blog, we text, we email. We love getting our words out there. We troll. We love knocking down the words of others. And so it's not wholly positive that in our Christian subculture, we prize cleverness with words. Words are very powerful, and God is very concerned for the passing on of them truthfully. But our uber-valuation of speech and the speaker may not all be good. Because in such a culture as ours, it is more than likely that people will want to be teachers for all the wrong sorts of reasons. And it's very likely that those who ought to be teachers aren't really all that keen. So be careful. Be careful who you encourage towards teaching roles. Be careful what you long for if you long to be a teacher. So often the reason we do want to be teachers is that we like to be listened to. We like to have people hear what we have to say. You really want that, says James? Think again. For we all have many sins, as is demonstrated by our tongues. So don't rush into being a teacher, because that brings with it stricter judgment. Be wise. Often the teacher is at the heart of relational dysfunction. Be careful. 
Be careful what you long for and who you encourage. And third, be humble. Our speech reminds us, doesn't it, of our need for grace. You don't have to be much of a teacher. You don't have to utter many words to be convicted of your need for God's mercy and kindness. Our speech reveals what we like. Our speech to and about others tells us what we think of God. And so the right thing to do at the end of a passage like this is to turn again to God for mercy and for grace to help in time of need. Let's pray together. Just a few moments to respond in the quiet uh, to what we've heard. James says, For every kind of beast and bird, reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. James says later on, but God's grace is bigger. He opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, before the Lord, and he will exalt you. Gracious Heavenly Father, in a world that longs for self-promotion and affirmation, We confess to you that so often we use our speech for those things, to promote ourselves, to knock others down, so that we can feel big. We pray that you would have mercy on us. We recognize that this is not what our mouths were made for. We ask that you would help us to uh, humble ourselves before you. We thank you that your grace is bigger than our dividedness and our sinfulness. We pray that we would long for our words to be used for the things that you've designed us for. Not only praising our God and Father, but also building up and encouraging and loving those who are made in his image. Hear us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing number 825. Number 825. This is a hymn that uh, reminds us again of our need for Jesus and his work on the cross for us from a life of weariness, Saviour, to your side I flee. Bring me back to Calvary. Number 825.
Let's pray together. And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all evermore. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.